Four Dioramas from the Beginnings of Psychopharmacology by Walter Taylor from the Sigiloff series. This 132nd scale model portrays four dioramas from the early history of modern psychopharmacology. Scene 1. Renowned Union surgeon Jacob Mendez de Costa was one of the first to formally connect psychological states to biological outcomes. A soldier he identified as WWH was seized with lancinating pains in the cardiac region, so intense that he was obliged to throw himself down upon the ground and with palpitation. The symptoms frequently returned while on the march, were attended with dimness of vision and giddiness, and obliged him often to fall out of his company and ride in the ambulance. Costa, 1871. Surgeon Costa treated this syndrome with the drugs at his disposal, digitalis, belladonna, opium, strychnine, and acetate of lead, among others. Tone, 2005. The memory of this event and his later work with over 300 other men like WWH inspired surgeon Jacob Mendez de Costa to publish an article in 1871 on irritable heart syndrome, one of the first studies on battlefield trauma. Though he does not limit mental disorders to military situations, the war gives many graphic examples of the effects of psychological damage. Some notes about this scene. There are no Red Crosses around, as Miss Clara Barton did not found the American branch of the Red Cross until after the war between the states was over. Soldiers may lay wounded for days on the battlefield before evacuation was possible. So, some nurses would bring bread and water to the battlefield to sustain the wounded until help could arrive. As the best men were wanted for a battle, there was trouble with ambulance drivers abandoning their vehicles on the way to the hospital. The drivers went missing, along with the whiskey that was meant for the wounded. Adams, 1983. The soldier holding the knees is Loretta, a woman. Some estimate that 400 women fought in that war, but others hold that number higher. Hall, 2005. Loretta, who did fight, has written an autobiographical account of her adventures. Valesquez, 2003. I chose her name because the feminine name Leto in Greek carries the meanings of hidden or forgotten. Both meanings apply to the women who fought in the American Civil War. As their combat service was mostly undocumented, we will never know the number for sure. Hypodermic needles were only then, just in 1863, coming into use. Few American surgeons had them. They were more common by the end of the war, and many servicemen were sent home after the war with morphine kits containing the needles. The ability to use injections and the invention of the modern microscope, also in 1863, helped set the stage for the soon-to-blossom pharmaceutical industry. Scene 2. A man is brought into a hospital in Rome, Italy, 1938. His family has been executed. Fear and violence, death and demons haunt him. Dr. Ugo Terletti is certain he can remove non-helpful memories. Electroshock therapy is born. After the initial electric shock, he watches as the patient convulses on the table, the haunting hallucinations of death and demons fading. This particular patient would have died within a month. Because of the electroshock, he has permanent brain damage, but will live peacefully in the hospital for four months before passing away. This was a sad affair. But from people like him, we now have therapies that give many people their life back. Some notes about this scene. The colors of the floor and walls I picked from my memory of hospitals in the late 50s and early 60s. The electroshock machine is modeled after an early version. A hand crank generated the unregulated voltage. Yep, this was quickly updated. Beliefs from ancient times postulate that many maladies can be shaken out of a person. Shamans shake, Quakers quiver, congregations convulse, religious overtones abound. Even today, people shudder with disgust. And Dr. Serletti was sure electroshock was a more controllable and therefore stable, predictable, and customizable method. He was right. The art is still being refined today. Scene 3. Next, we turn to Graz, Austria, April 4th, 1920. With the advent of electricity into science, assumptions were that the central nervous system was electrically based. While true, others, such as Otto Louis, felt sure that there was a chemical communication system active in the body. He had done work with frogs, as had predecessors like Galvani, but how to prove his hypothesis? Finally, on Holy Saturday night, 
He had a dream. In his own words, I woke, turned on the light, and jotted down a few notes on a tiny slip of thin paper. Then I fell asleep again. It occurred to me at six o'clock in the morning that during the night I had written down something, most important, but I was unable to decipher the scroll. Doniner and Limbic, 2006. He went to bed on Easter night, unable to remember the dream or understand his scrawl. The dream returned, and at 3 a.m. he awoke with full retention of the design of the experiment that revolutionized our understanding of the brain. He goes to his desk, makes notes, and draws his dreams. The servant, or lab assistant as we would now call him, responds to his cries of joy transferring fluid from a tank containing a stimulated heart into another tank containing an unstimulated heart, he reproduces in the second heart the heartbeat similar to the first. At various conferences, Otto was able to recreate his outcome. He was awarded the Nobel Prize along with his dear old friend Sir Henry H. Dale in 1936. A serious look at brain chemistry could now begin. Todman, 2008, Donner and Limbic, 2006. Some notes about this scene. Otto Louis' laboratory was on the first floor, as the window photo indicates, but chances are not to a view of the town square in Graz, Austria, as I have used. The floor was oak parquet, and the furniture was oak, but the walls were painted Pompeian red. Scene 4. We now travel to a mountain pond before the head of the Kavari River, South India, 1946. The British biochemist, Sir Robert Robinson, studied healing plants from around the world. In this piece of historical fiction, he has befriended a local South Indian ruler, the Raj, who arranged a meeting with a local herbalist, a Shaivite sadhu, who led Robinson to an old and forgotten shrine, where pilgrims would find relief from the troubles of life. In addition to the fresh mountain air, scenic wonders, and religious comfort, the pilgrims drank a tea made from Indian snake root. The sadhu digs out some of the snake root, which the Raj then takes, washes the dirt off the roots, and presents to Robinson, who at first does not even hear Raj, as he is so absorbed in the beauty of the mountains with all their flora, surely a paradise of pharmaceutical possibilities. Some notes about this scene. The plant is from India. Even Mahatma Gandhi used this root. It lowers blood pressure, suppresses the central nervous system, and is hypnotic. Sir Robert Robinson was an ardent mountaineer in his youth, but there is no evidence that this pastime took him to South India. Only the Alps, the Pyrenees, Norway, and New Zealand. Elvisor Publishing Company, 1964. He began working with Indian snake root in 1947. In 1952, Robinson, in conjunction with the Swiss pharmacist Emil Schittler, turned the root into the world's first pharmaceutical tranquilizer under the name Reserpent or Respirin. The stage was set for the blossoming of a pharmaceutical industry. Though Wikipedia, Wikipedia 2008, claims Reserpent has been taken off the market, I found a couple of companies still continuing its production. Department of Health and Human Services 2008. In closing. There are many events that shape the founding of modern psychopharmacology. I just picked four for this diorama that seem significant in different places and in different settings. I also hoped to portray a history that would inspire neither deification nor condemnation of the science, but rather put human faces on the discoveries and inspire others to look with more understanding on our shared trials and triumphs.